welcome to Journal Cards, a podcast for people who are passionate about journaling. Keep listening for more tips, tricks, and suggestions that will help you make the most out of your journaling practice. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Journal Cards. My name is Hannah, and thank you so much for listening today. Last week, we looked at what is journaling, and this week, we're going to answer the all-important question, how do you journal? So whereas in the last episode, we touched on a couple of the emotional benefits of journaling and why it's really helpful to us, this week, we're going to look at the practical details. So we're going to look at the what's, the where's, and the when's of journaling. In this episode, we're going to cover things like tools, frequency, the time of day to journal, how long you should spend journaling, and a little bit about privacy as well. So I thought it'd be good to start by exploring some of the tools that we can use to journal because there are so many. There's traditional pen and paper, which we're probably all most familiar with. And even within the category of just pen and paper, you have a lot of possibilities because you can stick sheets in a ring binder and organize them however you want, or you can keep a, you can go out and buy a really fancy notebook that feels really nice to use and nice to hold and keep your notes in chronological order. Or alternatively, you can just get a 50p bog standard reporter's notebook. Whatever you want to do, the most important thing is that it feels right to you. There's also digital journaling. Now, there's two different types of digital journaling. There's offline and online. So offline digital journaling would look like keeping your journaling notes in a Microsoft Word document, for example, or a Pages document if you're a Mac user or any other word processing document. There's also various kinds of software, journaling software that you can use. Um, I personally use Mac Journal by Mariner, which I found to be a really, really great journaling software. Um, you can customize the date of your entries. You can organize them into different digital notebooks. You can tag them. All, all kinds of really, really helpful features that make organizing and going back over your notes really easy as well. One of the great things about Mac Journal is that you can also encrypt your notes. So this is an optional feature, and it means that if your computer ever got lost or stolen or anything happened, you your notes will be protected because they'll be encrypted by the software. Mariner also offer journaling apps. So I have a, or I did have a Mac journal app on my iPhone when I had an iPhone. So I could enter in my notes on my iPhone and it would automatically sync with my computer. So that was really, really handy because it meant that I could make journaling notes on the go and I'd get back home and they would be in my Mac journal program in my computer. So that's just one example of um, offline digital journaling software. There are lots of different kinds so I do encourage you to look around and find the kind that is best for you but I've personally had a really positive experience with Mac Journal. Then there's online digital journaling and just like you can use Microsoft Word and Pages for offline journaling you can use things like Google Docs and other cloud storage programs to create a kind of no frills online journaling storage as well. And the really great thing about this is that when you're using one of these services, you can pretty much access your notes from anywhere with an internet connection. So as well as Google Docs, you have other journaling specific services like 750words.com, Pensy, and a whole host of other online journaling apps. I'm going to look at digital journaling versus traditional journaling a bit more in a future podcast episode. But for now, I'll just touch on the fact that you, as I mentioned before, you can also just get uh, mobile apps and you can journal through mobile apps as well. This might not be so convenient, but it is a great way of collecting and capturing your thoughts and your feelings while you're out and about during the day. The other kind of journaling I wanted to talk about is something that I found particularly helpful for some types of journaling, and this is audio journaling. So to give you an example, I like to record my dreams. I think dreams are really, really helpful as a kind of window into what's going on in your unconscious. I think often dreams are really helpful for showing us what is going on and what we're processing under the surface and the thoughts and the feelings that uh, are actually happening for us that we might not be aware of in our conscious day-to-day -day lives. And dreams are pretty cool as well because they're really metaphorical. They come up with some really interesting, crazy, wacky imagery sometimes. 
And I just have this real fascination. I find it really fascinating to see what my mind comes up with and the different metaphors and images that he uses to communicate to me what is going on inside my head. So I love recording my dreams. And I used to do this with pen and paper. And what I found is that I would get halfway down the page and I would fall asleep again. So I would have all these half-finished dreams that, of course, I couldn't remember when I wake up finally in the morning. So what I started doing is I would get my uh, my iPhone or my iPod and I would record the dream using the voice recorder. And there was something about talking, not writing, that meant it was harder. It was easier for me to stay focused on recording the dream and it was harder for me to fall asleep in the middle. Um, but it wasn't so stimulating that I couldn't fall asleep again afterwards. So that's something that I've used um, audio journaling for. And then I can, of course, transfer the notes to my computer and either type them up or just keep them in audio format. As I mentioned in the last episode, there's also art journaling, which is really, really helpful. And remember, you don't have to be an artist to do art journaling. It's not about the finished product. It's about what you get out of it. So your experience of actually doing the journaling and what you learn and the self-awareness you gain from it is far, far more important than what your finished product looks like because you're not making it to um, enter the Turner Prize. You're not making it to show to other people. You're just making it for your own experience of making it. It's the process that counts, not the finished product. Next, I thought it would be helpful to talk about the right time of day to journal. And as I said before, journaling is whatever you want it to be. So I don't think there is such a thing as a right or wrong time of day to journal. I do think, however, that different types of journaling are more useful at different times of the day. And the time of day that you journal really depends on what you want to get out of it. So, for example, last time I talked about something called morning pages. And this is really, really helpful in the morning, as the name suggests, because it helps you get all your ideas out of your head and onto paper and leaves you going ahead in your day with a clearer mind and more focus. I think this kind of practice can also be really, really helpful at night, especially if you find it hard to wind down in the evening, if you go to bed and your head is still buzzing with all these ideas. Writing 750 words or three pages, depending on whether you're using a, a computer or a notebook, can serve the same purpose as it does in the morning, and it can help you go to sleep knowing that everything is down on paper. You don't need to remember it. You can come back to it tomorrow if you want to, if it's important, but right now you don't need to be thinking about it. You've expressed it all. It's all down on paper. It's there waiting for you. Equally, there are other kinds of journaling that can be really helpful during the day, for example, at lunchtime on your lunch break. If you're having a bit of a tough day and you're feeling kind of down, you can use things like making a gratitude list to pick you up. The time of day that you do it really depends on what I talked about last time, which is the intention. So when you're thinking about the best time of day for you to journal, what I would suggest is thinking, okay, what do I want to get out of this? Do I want a way to clear my mind? Yes, if so, I'd recommend either journaling in the morning or the evening, or both, depending on how much spare time you have. Do I want a way to pick myself up when I'm feeling down? Do I want a way, do I want to develop my self-soothing and self-nurturing voices? Then the time that you journal will be less regular and more situational. So just have a think about why you want to journal, what the most important things are for you to get out of it, and that will inform the best time for you to journal. The next thing I want to talk about is the time spent journaling, and there's a lot of conflicting advice about this available. Personally, I think it doesn't matter. I think the more time is generally better, but it, again, it really depends on what you want to get out of it. I think there is also a risk that if you tell yourself that you need to spend half an hour journaling, and that's an absolute must, and you kind of make that rule for yourself, that you're going to end up wanting to avoid starting. You're going to end up feeling a lot of resistance to it because you might not always need to spend half an hour journaling. You might not always want to spend half an hour journaling. You might not always be able to spend half an hour journaling. Like I said, the longer the better, but I think it is also important to have a level of flexibility that you can use in your journaling practice too. In a couple of episodes time, I'm going to talk more about resistance. And in that episode, I'll go into more detail about this, this idea of 
balance and the difference between self-discipline and self-flagellation and and why it's not especially helpful for you to turn journaling into another quote should in your life or another obligation the next thing is the frequency this was something i got really really stuck on when i first started journaling at the risk of sounding like a broken record i don't know what the precise answer is to how frequently you should be journaling my personal opinion um, based on what i found helpful is that when you first start out every day is really helpful just to get you in the swing of it because when you first start out you're kind of it's like going to the gym for the first time ever and you're exercising all these muscles that you've never exercised before so going to the gym and working out for two hours and then going home and crashing and then not being able to go back for the next two weeks is not going to be particularly helpful to your fitness in the long run but going to the gym for 15 20 minutes even um, having a really gentle workout and kind of easing yourself into it and doing that every day or every other day is going to be much more helpful for your long-term fitness it's the same with journaling if you're just starting out with journaling easing yourself into it and doing you know, your morning pages or whatever else you want to do, but just doing a little bit every day is really, really helpful for getting the, the ideas flowing, for breaking down any defenses that you might have, and for making journaling an integral part of your life. As I mentioned in the introduction podcast, I've been journaling for six or seven years, and right now I like journaling a couple of times a week as and when I feel I need to. And I think that's another really important thing about frequency is that there will be times when you don't really feel like you need to journal as much as you do at other times. Again, I'm going to touch on this more in a couple of episodes, but it's important to be aware of the difference between not feeling the urge and feeling resistance, because quite often resistance can pop up in the form of not feeling the urge to journal. But um, we'll talk about that more in a couple of episodes. But if it is that you just don't really feel the urge, then you might only want to journal two or three times a week. I think that frequency is helpful as a minimum because it just keeps things ticking over and it keeps you in touch with yourself and in touch with what's going on for you internally. But again, I think it's really important not to turn journaling into this sense of obligation. Even if you're journaling a couple of times a week, you might find that there are times when you benefit from journaling more as well. For example, if you're having some changes in your personal life or if you have a difficult conflict that you need to work through, or if you're having a, a period where you're going through a lot of personal epiphanies about yourself and about the way you interact with other people and about what you want from life or various things like that, journaling more frequently, so perhaps returning to journaling every day, can be really, really helpful. Other people take the as and when approach, so they journal when they just feel like it. And this might also be something that works for you. Perhaps you want to carry a notebook around with you all day and Rather than dedicating a certain amount of time to journaling, perhaps you just want to write down stuff as it occurs to you, and that is absolutely fine too. Uh, Like I've said plenty of times now, it's not about the finished product, it's about the experience that you have of it and finding something that works for you. Journaling is whatever you want it to be. The last topic I wanted to briefly touch on here is privacy. Again, there's a lot of different advice about privacy, and whether you should show your journaling to other people and those sorts of issues in the journal sphere, if I can call it that. I know what my opinion is about it, but I do want to stress that as with all the other opinions I express on this podcast and all the other suggestions that I make, I think that everyone knows what's right for them deep down. And I trust you to make decisions about these things that work best for you. So my my personal feeling about privacy is, as I, I think I explained in the, the first podcast, I consider my journal notes completely private. I don't share them with anyone. I might occasionally share little snippets here and there or give a brief summary to my partner, for example, of something that I realized through journaling and paraphrase and everything. But I certainly don't give my journals to people to read. The main reason for this is... Well, there's two reasons. A, I don't think it's anyone's business. And um, the second reason is... From my perspective, I know that if I thought I was going to show my journaling notes to someone else, I would write like I was writing for an audience. I wouldn't necessarily be writing in the way that's most effective for me and for myself and for my self-knowledge. I would be far more likely to self-censor. So I would really, really think carefully. I think some people share by default 
just because they might have grown up in families where everyone kept a journal and that was what they did. They wrote in their journal and they shared it with other members of the family and so on. If you want to keep a journal purely as a record of your life, that can be a really nice thing to do. As far as personal development goes, I don't think it's very helpful myself. If you want to share the ideas that you've uncovered in your journaling and get feedback from other people about those, that's one thing. Actually showing your journal to someone else, it's such a personal insight into your internal world. And your internal world is so precious and so vulnerable and so integral to who you are. And equally, you know, if my if a friend or my partner said, oh, I'll give you my journal, I wouldn't read it. Just because personally, I think it is important to have boundaries. And I, I think if I were to get that kind of insight into someone else's internal world, it would almost feel a little bit voyeuristic to me. So that's just something to bear in mind when you're considering the privacy. And tagged onto that is the idea of privacy and online journaling. Websites like 750 Words and Penzi, I have no doubt that these websites are safe, but it is the internet. Uh, hacks do happen, data does get lost, etc. So whatever online journaling setup you're using, I would recommend taking steps to protect your personal information, like you would on a forum, for example. So I, I used to use 750 Words. I used it for quite a while, and I used a false name, and I didn't name anyone I was writing about I used initials and that still worked for me because I knew who I was talking about but if anyone had managed to access my notes and view my notes there was no way that they would have been able to potentially trace it back to me perhaps that sounds really paranoid perhaps it's very paranoid like I said when you journal it's really important that the space you have is safe that comes from keeping your notes private and also safeguarding yourself in instances when your privacy has the potential to be compromised as well. Just to summarize what we've been talking about in this podcast, you have a lot of options when it comes to the tools you use. You can use digital journaling, you can use traditional pen and paper journaling, you can use art journaling, audio journaling, whatever else you want to use. The time of day will really depend on what you want to get out of your journaling. So have a think about why you want to engage in a journaling practice and what the intention is there for you. What would you like to experience as a result of your practice? We also discussed frequency where my personal recommendation is to try to journal every day if you're just starting out with your journaling practice, but then to trust yourself and in all cases to find that balance between having the self-discipline to journal in a way that is healthy for you and not turning it into an internal obligation or rule. Because as we all know, rules are made to be broken. Finally, we've just talked about privacy. I mentioned that my personal opinion is that journaling is most effective when it's for your eyes only. And therefore you should write with the intention that you will keep it private. And that it's important to bear your security and privacy in mind when you are using an online journaling service too. At the very end, I want to finish up this episode by saying, please remember that it's not about spelling or grammar. It's not about creating amazing artwork. It is about the experience and what you get out of it and what you want to get out of it too. Journaling, like all personal development, is very much a process, not a destination. So I hope you will enjoy the ride. The suggestion that I wanted to give you this week is a list of 100 this is a suggestion that I really love doing. I got it from a book called Journal to the Self by Kathleen Adams, and you can find the link to that in the show notes. List of 100 is pretty self-explanatory. It's a list of 100 items, and this can be 100 things about anything. So 100 places I'd like to visit, 100 things I'd like to own, 100 things I'd like to say, 100 things I'd like to do, 100 things I own, 100 things I'd like to make, 100 people I'd like to meet. As you can see, there's lots of possibilities. One of the things this suggestion is really helpful for is overcoming creative blocks and getting your mind moving again if you find that you've been stuck in a particular pattern of thought or feeling. This is because it's quite often really hard to get to 100 immediately when I've made these lists. What I found is that it really makes you think. It forces you to think laterally, outside the box, however you want to put it. And that is really, really helpful for getting your creativity flowing in other areas of your life too. 
It's also a really, really fun exercise. And some of the answers might be very surprising to you. I know that they certainly have been to me. So this week, I really want to encourage you to keep up with your morning pages. It doesn't matter if you've fallen off the wagon. This is a great time to restart. And also to choose one or more lists of 100 and try to complete them by next week. There's still a work in progress by the time the next episode comes up. Don't worry about it. But give yourself permission to be creative and dream big. That's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any feedback about this show or any questions about journaling or anything else, please feel free to email me at hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. You can find out more about journaling, authentic living and creating the life you want from the inside out by visiting my website www.becomingwhoyouare.net. Thanks again for listening and I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of JournalCast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with me by emailing hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. Remember that my book, The Ultimate Guide to Journaling, is available through all major ebook retailers and as an audiobook through www.becomingwhoyouare.net. So pick up your copy and inspire your journaling practice today. See you next time.